my father's parents passed away. Uh, my, my grandfather passed away before I was born, and then my grandmother passed away when I was young. But my mother's parents uh, lived uh, into my teenage years, and uh, well, my grandfather did. Uh, my mother's father retired in the early 1980s, uh, had owned a, a lumber yard in South Florida and was working on developing it in retirement uh, into an office complex, um, but retired at age 62, took reduced social security, and then passed away uh, six years later in 1988 at the age of 68. For that generation, so my grandfather was born in 1919, that was not totally atypical. It's a little bit shorter at, uh, than life expectancy and longevity at that point. It was about 71, 72 for men. Um, but then my grandmother it blew the doors off the numbers at the other end of the spectrum. She actually ended up passing away in 2012 at the age of 95. She was born in 1917. And I used to tell that story during my social security seminars because she lived on a reduced payment from social security the rest of her life. And I used to always use it as a example of why filing at age 62 might not be the right choice for the primary earner, even if their own health and longevity isn't great if their spouse uh, has longevity in their family. But it's also a great story to introduce our topic for this week, uh, longevity. It's not just how long you live, because of the fact that it really outlines the two ends of the spectrum statistically, um, that the shorter end being, hey, I retire and then pass away relatively quickly, but then living into your 90s, especially for that generation, was really next to unheard of. Um, and now that longevity is starting to increase, it's becoming more and more common all the time. And so that's why this week on the Valuability Podcast, as I mentioned, episode eight, longevity. It's not just how long you live. The Valuability Podcast is for financial advisors, business owners, and anyone interested in financial planning, business, leadership, and personal development. We believe that financial success comes from building a plan on the foundation of your values and building your ability will help you get there. My name is Danforth Fleek. I was a financial advisor and product wholesaler in the financial services industry for over 20 years. I am joined each week by my co-host, uh, good friend and mentor, Philip Simonson. Philip has been in the financial services industry for over four decades uh, in a wide range of roles, uh, financial advisor, leadership, training, um, executive management, and uh, it's been a great amount of fun getting this project up and running. How's this week been for you? Well, Dan, it's pretty good up here in the uh, great north tundra. The ice <laughs> finally dropped. It's all gone. Uh, it's yeah, I can see just a wee little bit out in Wake 'em Up Bay. Uh, right. <laughs> so the the big uh, challenge then, you know, it's not sauna, it's sauna. Will be this weekend. <laughs> I will be in sauna, which I do about three to four times a week, and uh, I will be jumping in the lake uh, uh. versus carving the ice out and jumping in. I've only done that once, so. <laughs> the only one. Stupid is optional. And one's good enough. <laughs> well, down here it's been uh, in the Minneapolis area. It's been quite nice uh, getting out and uh, trying to get the uh, uh, my hound enough exercise while all of this uh, crazy social distancing is going on. So 
Uh, everything is uh, a okay down here as well. So uh, you can find our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn. We have a YouTube channel. Search Value Dash Ability on YouTube. You can find us there, or. Uh, you can check out our website, value-ability.com. Click on the Episodes tab, and all of our recent episodes are there. Wherever you find us, like, review, subscribe, share. Uh, please uh, take the time to do that. It really does help us out. Uh, you can also sign up for our mailing list. Uh, we develop uh, s- special content uh, for our mailing list subscribers. Go to value-ability.com. Click on Contact Us. You can sign up there. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, Twitter is the best way to contact us. Uh, and Instagram is where you can find all of our visuals. If we refer to any visuals in our episodes, you can find it on our Instagram account. Uh, you can also find that on our website, value-ability.com, or connect with us on Facebook. Search at valueability, all one word, on Facebook, and you can find our uh, visuals there as well. So, Philip, last week uh, we did a little exercise, a little mind exercise, and then, uh, as usual with the two of us, we kind of spun off and uh, forgot to come back to it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I believe it was the, uh, it was the golf uh, uh, the golf riddle. Uh, if I'm your caddy and you offer me 500 bucks or a penny on the first hole and then double it each hole, which would I prefer? And I, I would say that I know that I would want to take the penny, but if you were asking, you know, 19 year old Danforth Fleek, I'm sure he would have taken the 500 bucks in a flash. <laughs> So why don't you fill everybody in on on the answer? Sure. The answer is, for those who have completed it, $2,949.12 is what you would get if you took one penny the first hole, second hole you get two, third hole you get four, then you can see the trend. Point of this is we talked about last week in the episode seven, the silent embezzler in the Dan covered the rule of 72. Is, and if you do this exercise, write it out. I'd still, you know, still, if you haven't done it, do it. Take a look at the last five holes. That's where you're making your most money. I'll just give it to you. At, at hole 15, you'd have earned 184. So you still would have been better off with 500. But then take that time. You doubled it. It was at 368 for the 16th hole. 17th hole, 737. Then the 18th is 1,400 and uh, 1,474. Well, I said 19th because you can want to take it to the boot of my car and I'll, while I'm going in and enjoying my favorite libation. What I want you to take away with, uh, take from this is, again, time is your greatest asset. And if you, an old wise farmer taught me when I was running the South Dakota division back in 94, he said, look, your first 500,000 is the hardest. And you want to get that by the age of 40. And if you, you know, at that time, you know, rule of 72, you get a 10% historical, you know, let's say a 10% rate of return on your money. 47, that's now a million. 54, age 54, it's 2 million. You know, 61, you'll have 4 million. Game over. At 4%, 160,000, I'd suggest if you can't live on that, you've got some problems. Absolutely. So great to circle back there and uh, finish up that little uh, uh, that little thought exercise that we did last week. So going off into our main topic then, uh, longevity. It's not just how long you live. Uh, Philip, you had a couple of uh, statistics that you wanted to share with us right off the bat just about the basics of longevity. Uh, why don't you share those? Well, you know, there's a couple things I'd share with you just as, and I know you'll expound on this as well, but the chances if you and your, your significant other or partner hit the age of 62, um, there's a good chance one of you are going to live into your 90s. And as we shared before, what I want to make a point on is that, again, the rule of 72. If 
historically, the last 20 years, 3% inflation on average, the CPI. At 62, 3% into 72, well, that's 24 years. If you needed 50000 which is the average typical American retired income today, you'd need 100000 at age 86. So you got to make sure, what are you doing to, to double or triple your your portfolio in your retirement years. It's just not all go safe and put it into the CDs or into bonds. So those are my couple points I always wanted to make. Absolutely. I mean, looking back at my grandfather's generation, I mean, that absolutely was. And even when I came into the business in the mid-90s, there was still that pretty firmly entrenched, hey, take all your investments, dump it into you know, government and muni bonds and live off the interest because you're going to live for eight to 12 years sitting in the rocking chair mm -hmm. and, you know, over an eight to 10 year period, even relatively high rates of inflation aren't going to have that tremendous of an impact because, of course, you've also got the principle that you could erode over time. Whereas when you start talking about these longer time frames, it you know longevity is actually the key that really makes the other risks that we've talked about so vitally important right inflation isn't that big of a deal if you don't live very long and if inflation isn't that big of a deal you don't have to take market risk so you don't have sequence of return risk, right? So all of these things really play back into longevity is really the key risk that causes these other risks to become an issue. And one of the things that I always stressed with trying to explain to clients and individuals is, again, societally, we don't have a historical imprint for living a really long time in retirement. Right. Like my grandmother was really one of the first that lived a really long time like that. Uh, whereas in my grandfather, you know, my grandfather died almost right away. And that was really what was m more expected at the time in the 80s and 90s was, OK, yeah, you retire and maybe you make it to 70, 75, you know, on the outside 80. So I actually wanted to share some of those numbers. Uh, I went back and pulled the numbers from uh, 1965. So life expectancy numbers from 1965. And then I found them compared to 2015. So it's so relatively recently mm -hmm. for a 65. Five-year-old male uh, in 1965, you had an 81 percent chance of living to age 70, uh, and that has increased to 90 percent. Uh, in 1965, a 65-year-old male had a 41 percent chance of living to 80. That has risen to 62 percent. It's gone up by 50 percent. So from 42 percent, added half of its value to 62 percent. Uh, women were had a 62% chance of living to age 80, and that has only gone up to 71%, but still significantly higher. Uh, and then age 90 is even more shocking for men. Uh, in 1965, you had a 10% chance of living to 90, and now it's it's doubled to over over doubled to 22%. Uh, women have gone from 25 to 34% chance. And this also then doesn't also take into account joint life expectancy, right? Because that's the main issue with financial planning is that it's not a single life issue for most people. It's a, it's a joint life issue. You have to cover both lives with income. So once you start throwing in the fact that you are dealing with two people, it becomes even, even more shocking. So we'll, we'll do this a slightly different way. We're going to take a look at um, if you're 65 years old, um, what is it? 25% uh, chance of living to what age? The, this is also the other thing I like to stress about longevity. People use average life expectancy. Many people make the mistake of thinking, oh, well, then that's the number I should plan to. Well, no, that's just the coin flip. <laughs> average life expectancy means... 50-50 chance <laughs> that you'll be alive at that age, right? So if we're trying to reduce risk for your plan, 
you know, an acceptable amount of risk is not 50. <laughs> Even 25% is is a pretty high level of risk to accept. Um, and those numbers are even pretty shocking. So a 65-year-old man has a 25% chance of making it to age 89. Uh, a female has a 25% chance of making it to 92. And as a couple, they have a 25% chance of one of them being alive at 94. And then 10% chance... Uh, they don't go up extravagantly, but still m more, a 10% chance of living to age 93 as a man, 95 as a woman, and about age 97 as a couple. So your you know, 24 years is even probably a little short. Sure. If you're 65 and you want to reduce that you know, down to a 10% chance, you're looking at trying to plan to age 97, so 33 years in retirement would be the number that I I would personally would recommend people use. Um, so those are just some of the numbers on the outside that, that just make this pretty shocking. And again, though, there isn't really a lot of cultural knowledge around this idea. And again, that's to be expected. <laughs> Right. There's not a lot of reason for people to know these things, but we are as a society, especially over the last 20 years, you have stories like mine where, you know, long term care issues are becoming way more common later in life. Uh, I took care of my mom for uh, 12 years. Uh, so people are getting more and more used to that. People are getting more and more used to having parents move back in with them later in Brady life. annexes are coming back. Right. Right, yeah, the 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 mother-in-law apartments and and things like that. Well, I grew up with kids, you know, you know, on my block with their grandmothers and grandparents living with the uh, with with their parents or with them. That was quite common back in the fifties, sixties. Absolutely, and and pretty common in farming and you know communities, rural communities as well, right? Because they're all in the same small geographic area, you, you're absolutely correct. It's really only been in the last 30 or 40 years where we've become much more mobile and you don't have all the kids living around anymore and and the kids all, you know, move off to the big city and leave old Duluth. Well, and, uh... <laughs> it was the Generation X, you know, Generation, you know, baby boomers, the me generations. Well, we weren't going to have our parents move in with us. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's it's coming around again, full circle, you know, just from a Absolutely. financial need. And but there's a great emotional benefit by having your grandparents there. A lot of wisdom and lessons to be learned. Absolutely, I I say that all the time. Um, in fact, I just uh, tweeted it the other day in response to to someone else's uh, tweet that. Um, you know, having my mom come and live with me was one of the best experiences of my life, absolutely. But I was also in a position, uh, you know, no family, no spouse, to be incredibly flexible and make that choice completely easily. Like it was, it was very easy for me to rearrange my life in order to uh, be able to care for her. Um, you want to be able to make that choice of your own discretion and not be forced into it and not have it upend your life. And so having options and being prepared for those things is always the best option, right? Um, that's, that's an interesting thing, you know, that the, the, the most surprising thing I found about taking care of a parent, this isn't exactly on topic, but it, it just popped to mind is that the, I loved having my mom move in with me. Now we were very close and she was an awesome person. Um, and there are plenty of people that have that kind of relationships with a parent. Um, but the hardest part actually f was watching her have to come to terms with being the dependent which was something that totally blindsided me. Like, because, you know, we kind of moved in, she moved in and kind of assumed the normal roles of parent and kid. And, you know, one day I just kind of got tired of her lecturing me <laughs> as a 
30 year old adult at the time and I, I kind of snapped at her and, and it really affected her and she really started to realize that that things were different and you know she had moved into my house and and it was my joke I kind of barked at her you know what mom I'll I'll get to it when I'm ready because this is my house and I pay the bills right I joke I'd been waiting 30 years to say that to my mom. <laughs> okay, what goes around comes around. And a little bit of that. Um, but then she turned around, went back into her room and cried for a week. And <laughs> I, that certainly didn't make me feel great. But, and, and it, but it did. It really made me start to realize, you know what? Here's this woman that had, you know, put herself through school, took care of her two kids as a single mom, became super successful, and then had it all snatched away and was basically the old lady living in my spare bedroom. Right. And, you know, that watching that happen was the, by far the most difficult thing. And I, I say that to people all the time. I'm like, hey, look, I, I'm sure your kids will take care of you. That's not going to be the hard thing. <laughs> The hard thing is you're going to have to deal with your emotions. Well, we're hardwired as emotional creatures first, and that's spot on. And some of those key emotions, are, you know, back to point, but you know, I want to finish just what you're saying, and sorry for the interruption, but you're, you know, this is an experience, Dan. You know, my folks and my mother-in-law still live in 96. Emotionally, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's the giving up and letting go. I got to first let go with the keys to the car. You know, it's it's that personal freedom. Then it's the checkbook. Those are just, you know, things you have to work through as a family with, with your adult parent. And they're not easy. But we're all going to be faced with that. And it's, it comes down to acceptance is the bottom line. Yeah, I've already told my, uh, my good friend uh, that she has uh, complete, free reign when I get to that point in my life if I make things difficult the way my mom did about giving up the checkbook and giving up the key keys to the car that she has every every right to smack me (laughs) (laughs) but yeah it's I mean you know it's just such an important thing that people really start to focus in on understanding how key longevity uh, is to the whole planning process and, and ways to get their clients to understand that. Now, um, got some Philip, tips. you had found yeah. a site that uh, oh, that actually it. has some specifics, right? Because that's always the thing that, that clients or individuals will say, right, as well. But my you know, health is blah. And so I'm just not going to worry about it. And, and many times they're not taking things into account. The one that I always love is, oh, well, my parents didn't live all that long. They lived to age 85. Well, right. But your parents were, you know, like my grandparents, they were born in 1919. Living to age 85 was 10 years past life expectancy. And so there are these, you know, mistakes people make and with relation to how longevity has changed and you you had some tips to share with folks sure thanks dan a couple things specifically on that one is uh, go to a living to uh, living to 100.com and complete the health survey both for your you know it's a health survey for your family historical uh, medical uh, health records as well as your personal one and along with your lifestyle. So with that, then they can figure out particularly how long uh, you, you will probably live and you're going to get the probabilities there. Now, how I, how I use that with clients and working with other, other advisors, let me just share a couple other tips here. One, I always look at life as there's three stages. There's your infancy to age, I say 25. It can be longer, shorter, depending. But those are your learning years, more from the formal academic. Then from 25 to 65, and, and, and you know, this is again an average, those are your earning years. And beyond can either, 65 or beyond, on average, can be either your golden or your yearning years. And when you look at that retirement planning, as Dan has been emphasized, it's important to, to sit down with your advisor or if you're you know, listening and you're good do-it-yourself or get some, you know, there's planning software out there you can use. But, you know, my analogy is this. 
If you're going to build a house, you wouldn't do it without a blueprint. You'd get a blueprint to follow. Same thing as you go into retirement. You should make sure you do a retirement plan. It must consist of a couple things. One, minimum, it, it, your needs analysis. You know, how long your money is going to last. Do those projections at a 3%, 4%, or 5% distribution rate. I like using 4%, uh, but again, you know, play with the numbers. Then look at the impact on, uh, on either of you or your spouse if one of you or both of you should have to go into assisted living. You know, can you afford to, uh, the expense, expenses on uh, you know, two different places? You know, if you're still keeping your, your home while someone has to go into assisted living, you know, you're doubling up there. Then I would also, Dan's the expert on this one, but take a look again in your, in your retirement. Should you do the tax and, you know, a tax and uh, social security optimization strategies? Then, then at that point, once you got the needs done, then you can play out with, play with your wants and dreams. You know, maybe you, want, you might want to make, you know, help pay for your children, grandchildren's education. Uh, you might want to leave a legacy. Uh, to someone um, or, you know, your children or to someone else or maybe to a charity. Some of my clients wanted to start gifting. Now, I would have to encourage them. No, you, yes, we can gift, but not too early. Let's make sure that, one, we're not going to run out of money. Two, because this, long, you know, how long you potentially live, we don't want to start giving money uh, that, you know, let's say it's $10,000 every year starting in, uh, you know, 65 Maybe we'll start it at 75. But at some point in one of those reviews, though, what I'll do is my clients, I said, now it's the time to start, let's start giving. And there's two benefits by doing this. One, you can see how your family is enjoying or the person who is going to be receiving this gift, how well they've enjoyed it versus never knowing how it had made an impact in their life. Secondly, we can see how well they manage it. And if they don't manage it well, then you know what? We can protect them from getting this bigger pot of money coming down the pipe. Then, you know, take a look. A lot of people would, you know, in your retirement years, there's really three stages there. There's the go-go years, slow-go years, and no-go years. What I found when people hit the age of 78 to 80, they go into the slow-go years. They don't want to travel as much. So one of these wants and dreams, build into your plan, look, every five years or whatever it is, three years or seven years, you're doing a major holiday. Or maybe it's purchasing a new car every five to seven years. Build it out and see if you can actually do it. Then I would suggest, and it's going to be part of the article review, so I'm going to hold there and I pause there, Dan, but uh, <laughs> let's just take my personal situation. Dan, in the earlier episode... I said, well, you have uh, great timing. You're going to go into retirement and, oh, when was that? First of this year, semi-retirement. What happened? Well, just a couple months. To, you know, now it's unbelievable. You know, a month and a half ago, we hit this crisis. So what? a tip I, I, I did practice what I preached. Make sure, you know, we did this in episode, the, the four cornerstones, smart money allocation. Make sure if our goal was 120,000 to have coming in. Well, like you know, 21,500 comes from this uh, pensions. You know, 67,000. I'm doing some consulting, uh, etc. So that's let's just say as an example, if this is it. 87,500 would be my total there. Well, I'm short then 32.5. Take that times two years. This was that cornerstone two. Uh, where you you know your cash reserves and take it times two so you have a total of sixty five thousand sitting. So if you do hit the worst thing that can happen in the first two years of your retirement, you hit a recession. Well, now you don't have to you know do the four percent distribution, and I don't have to sell shares. You know, in in into uh, if you run from a bear, you're going to get mauled. You know, particularly a grizzly. If you run into a bear market, you're going to get mauled. You're going to be you know you're going to lose money. But at the same token, then, uh, as Dan pointed out a couple of weeks ago, and I just want to reemphasize this, if you had a million going into you know retirement, and you're you know you hit a recession that stays flat, and you got gobbled up twenty percent right away, you went to eight hundred. It's now worth eight hundred thousand. 
if in this case, you know, you needed that 35,000, you had to keep taking it as distribution. And before some a good advisor told you to cut your uh, you know, monthly income needs, if you can still do it, but you'd be down to, you know, 65,000, 30, you know, I'd be at 735,000. You know, it's going to be tough to get back. So those are just you know, some of my tips, Dan, that I would uh, encourage uh, individuals who are listening or advisors who are listening to you know, do that plan with your clients. Oh, one last thing. One year before retirement, we all take this mystical number and, and hey, I need 80,000. I need 120 that I just gave you. Try to live on it for one year. That's great advice. Right? See if you can actually do it because you're giving up your number one asset and that's your ability to work. And so, yes. So um, I do have a story, Dan, if it's, uh, do we have time for a little story? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. uh, The story is this. It's my father. Now, this is a man. He was born 1918, first generation. He never made more than, uh, at the very end, 33000 for an annual income. Four children. Raised us in a 17,000 square foot home. I'll never forget. 1,700. Oh, I said 17,000. <laughs> I always have, I like those commas. I like those commas. He wasn't a two comma. You didn't live on that side of Duluth. No. I know. I know where the houses are that size in Duluth, and you didn't live no. there. We lived in good old middle-income America <laughs> and uh, very traditional upbringing. Now, Pa, I finally said, hey, you never graduated from high school. He said, how do you know? Your mother never figured that out. I said, well, your sentences are, um, you know, they're not quite complete. And he said, no, I was, you know, I'm first generation. You saw how I was raised. You saw Grandma, who lived, by the way, to age 95. I went off dirty 30s. I left at 16, went into a CC camp. As soon as that was done, I then went into the war, came back. I started working for Ma Bell climbing telephone poles. I ended up getting into management. And so I was doing some of his planning. And I finally, it was, I can't remember if it was, it would have been mid 90s or late. 80s and I, th- I would say it was probably the mid 90s as i think back as the first part of the decade i was over in england setting up that planning company for american express financial planning company but i came back and I said pop congratulations you're a millionaire and uh, i think it's time now to diversify and he's retired of course he retired in 82 he said no i'm not going to do that that's uh, and here's why he says, I know that makes good sound sense. And in your profession, yes, you would tell me that. But he said, see, here's what I know. I like the dividends off of Ma Bell and those baby bells. They get me around 4 to 5%. As a matter of fact, I get close to 45000 a year on dividends. You take my pension, you take my Social Security... I'm living quite well. And they're historically, they do not change the share, you know, what they're paying out per share. So even though if the shares go down, I still get my same dividend. What you and your uh, siblings decide to do with that stock, that's up to you. So I just want to share that, you know, if some of you, you know, some of you might be applying a you know, dividend distribution strategy. And as we said a couple of weeks back, there's some good companies out there right now, big blue chips that are paying some very good dividends. And that was a good lesson that he, he taught me. Absolutely. And that one thing I will point out, though, is he did have the old traditional three-legged stool of pension, social security, and his additional savings. So That's very helpful. <laughs> but you know, today, 31% still have a pension. I'm, you know. Yeah, some, of some kind, yep. Yep. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to circle back the uh, website that you mentioned because I think it's super important when people have an actual estimation of their own longevity when they're going into the planning process. It's living to 
one zero zero, correct? That's the dot com. That's the the website. Yes. Okay, so living to one hundred, and the the one hundred is numerals, so it's living to one zero zero. Yeah, you got it. Dot com. Excellent. So with that, we are going to move on to our article for the week. And actually, as Philip mentioned, uh, this week's article is going to be circling back to one of our prior episodes as well. Um, It is uh, titled, This Retirement Strategy Worked Like a Charm When the Stock Market Crashed. Uh, And this article actually goes through a topic that we talked about and you mentioned already this episode's our our four cornerstones episode so if you haven't listened to that go back and and review that Uh, but it's essentially a bucket strategy Um, we uh, like a four bucket strategy of risk the uh, one to two or one to three year bucket and then a uh, you know a two to five or three to five year bucket and then your five plus year bucket Um, and all of those materials are also available out on our website value-ability dot com uh, click on the content section and you can find all of our four cornerstone pieces uh, that are available but uh, yeah it's this article I'm not going to read from it but a couple of things that I took away from it is uh, you know 88 year old client feeling great peace of mind having that you know two year cash allocation uh, also does get into the the counter argument to that, which is that, hey, that's a pretty big drag on your earnings for your overall portfolio. Um, but I think that actually, you know, that's one point that I wanted to make because I, I, I understand that argument intellectually, but I think that that argument really misses the entire point of the bucket strategy, which is it's not a single portfolio anymore. <laughs> By by breaking it into buckets, you are Mm -hmm. taking each individual portfolio and saying, you know, when I'm 40 and I'm getting ready for retirement 25 years from now, it's fine to think of my portfolio as a single entity. And it's just this thing that I'm dumping money into uh, trying to get to retirement. But once you get to retirement, as we talked in that uh, the uh, Need, Fun, Love episode, you transition to being really kind of a business owner and you have these assets that are trying to manage multiple goals. And so your your cash bucket, you can't look at that and and complain that it's a drag on your overall return because that's not the point <laughs> of that cash allocation. The point of that cash allocation is to protect you against things like this. And that's what this really article gets into is clients who are saying, you know what, I, I feel great right now because I've got this uh, this cash reserve. The couple other things that popped out to me um, uh, is that uh, one of the things to be wary of is remember that hey, the longer you are dipping into your cash portfolio, the more you have to replenish it from the second bucket. Right. Or in our case, it's the, the, the third bucket. Our first one is risk. Second is the cash allocation. Third is your intermediate you know, bond type uh, uh, holdings. Um, and that's a very, very good point as well. That bucket can be pretty different depending on advisors. Some advisors go very, very safe and secure uh, debt instruments. Others can put some riskier assets in there. Um, you know, maybe some corporate bonds or some high yield bonds and things like that. And so you really do need to remember that that secondary bucket does need to be available to replenish that that first bucket. So I thought that was uh, very interesting as well. Um, do you have thoughts on the on the article, Philip? Yes, a uh, couple key differences that uh, from our episode you know, that you hit on one of them is the first cornerstone and that's risk management and i just you know if you happen to read the article and and look at it if you if you're a financial advisor out there again an individual just managing managing your own portfolios and your financial destiny make sure you look at that uh, and the risk management don't you you Look at that long-term care. Run the projections. See what happens if one of you would go into a long-term care or nursing home facilities, because that that can be up to eight to ten thousand dollars a month right now. 
then you know if you happen to be one of those 31 uh percent uh, who people who get a pension still you know help your people figure out you know should, you know the beneficiaries of the you know what options you have with this pension is it a hundred percent survivor you know uh you know payout or am i going to take a 50 percent uh 75 percent uh, payout of my pension and then you know so i can then leave a portion for survivorship but you know if you're healthy take a look at pension max and then i would uh look at legacy and estate tax buying particularly you know uh, you know, state, ta if you live in a state with a heavy estate, you know, estate tax, as long as you're still healthy before you start playing around with these other cornerstones, cover your basis on, on that. And Dan, my last thing here, you said it, the beauty of the four cornerstones or the three bucket article is you're teaching your people how to think. And that's the hardest thing we have to do as financial advisors, as parents, as in, you know, as, you know, as coaches or you know, employers, teaching people how to think and be able to make good decisions. And what you're doing here, in, in particular here, you're keeping it really simple, and you're breaking down their portfolios and putting them into cornerstones, cornerstones or buckets that they can relate to. And as I said in that article. Both advisors, I think, they didn't have any of their clients sell because they know that that uh, last cornerstone, five plus years, or the last bucket, they don't, you know, we'll be on the other side and life will have moved on. So there's no need to sell. Absolutely. Yeah, that uh, advisor that talks about the fact that uh, none of his clients have sold during this crisis uh, also makes a great point right at the end of the article. Uh, he says, um, uh, Long Island financial planner Larry Hellers said he might need to suggest some clients reduce their spending. Uh, that happened in the financial crisis, so the market fell 57%, and people panicked and demanded an escape from stocks. Um, uh, he said that it's not been happening this time, um, but I thought, the again, that expense piece is so key to everything. You know, it's one of my catchphrases you know it's not really income planning it's expense planning mm -hmm. that in times where you, there are things you can't control you need to revert back to the one thing you can control for certain and that is your expenses um uh you know go through those credit card statements go through those bank statements look for areas where you know in good times you're you know paying that uh, i had a still had a serious satellite um uh, subscription and since i haven't been traveling lately and driving around i never listened to it but that was 10 bucks a month i was just throwing away not using it uh, so those little tips about yeah you know managing expenses i always am always going to glom onto those and then lastly just to wrap up the article i did want to share uh something that philip and i had talked about this week you know all of these different types of uh, planning processes, whether it's the four cornerstones, a bucket strategy, or the need fund love uh, type of strategy that we covered in an episode. It's all about understanding the risks and then making a decision relative to that risk, right? There are really four decisions you can make around risk. Number one, ignore it, which I would put forth is not an option, <laughs> but it... it, it Doing nothing and ignoring it is an option. Uh, you can accept the risk and and pl make plans around it without transferring any of that risk. Um, you can cover some of the risk or you can cover most or all of the risk. And so those are your options for dealing with any risk. And so, it, again, as an advisor, as an individual, I always say, look, in the end, it is entirely up to you what risk you take. Um, but for me, the way I felt as an advisor, I always felt like I at least had to talk to the client about there are ways that we can transfer some of this risk if you want to. And then if they chose not to do it, I knew I had at least covered my anatomy. So with that, we will wrap up the article portion of the episode and we are going to move on to our question um we have another 
non-financial services question this week, um, and one that's close to both Philip and my hearts. Uh, what is the most important key to self-development you have learned during your career? And Philip, I'll let you start. I think it's just a great question. Um, and I think what I've learned, my greatest success is getting comfortable with myself. Now, it took, took some time, but it came about by increasing my self-awareness. And that's number one. And in order to be able to become more self-aware, I had to become more accepting of feedback. And feedback by nature is critical versus validation. Validation, you're looking for attaboys, girls. So there's a, there is a difference. And the feedback, if you, if, and there's different ways you can get feedback. I happen to belong to one of the you know, Dow Jones Industrial 30, American Express, for my first 15 years. So they, and Harvey Golub, you've heard me talk about him. He was... He headed up McKinsey and Company, and particularly their uh, training and business development. So he really believed in his, his individuals and his employees were their, his number one assets. So he did a lot in regard to developing us. You know, so we, you know, we had the e, you know, you had EQI self assessment, the 360. There's social styles, which we're going to talk about next week. There's the Myers Briggs. There's the DISC. All the different good tools that you can use to help uh, you take a look at the next key thing that you know in this self-awareness and becoming more comfortable with yourself is what are your strengths and if you know what your strengths are that's going to help you set goals and particularly you know I went to you know, uh, every year at the end of December first part of January I would set my goals what I, where I wanted to be both personally in my career as well as financially and and I'd lay out the key activities. You know, the five profoundly simple steps of goal development, they're simple in concept, but not necessarily easy in implementation. I learned that from my mentor, uh, Doug Lennick. And it's just have a goal, then establish the key activities, focus on, and what I'm going to stop right there, well, third is implement, fourth is man monitor progress and five is uh, of course you know if the goal setting was easy there wouldn't be any more self-help book self-help books you know is you know how to throw off discouragement when you're not achieving what it is you want for yourself but uh, that knowing your strengths that's the key is helps you set goals but also flip side of that is you know you're going to come to terms and with uh, your weaknesses and i just had to you know Great phrase I love to use there, and I've learned it through, you know, with Garrett and uh, my, one of my sons, you know, we're all perfectly imperfect, and it's progress, not perfection, that one should look at. And, and by doing that, then I can then start uh, taking those weaknesses and turn them into strengths, or definitely delegating them out. I'm not touching that. Because uh, that is not playing to my strength, and I don't get energy from it. I don't get passion from it. I should be, you know, delegate that and go to something else. And then finally, the other thing for that self development and learning ultimately the self awareness, so you become comfortable with yourself. You got to have the courage. And you know, and courage, as I define courage, is that's when your knees get really wobbly and they're knocking together. At that point, move forward, not backwards. And it's be willing to let go of the past and move into the future. And so you can that's, you know, obtain some real growth. Excellent. And uh, my answer kind of plays right off of that because I, I think for me, um, goal setting absolutely was a huge key um, in – me starting to understand how I could develop. Um, I will admit under sometimes duress that I was kind of an arrogant <laughs> young man, very sure of my own uh, abilities in certain ways, mm -hmm. um, uh, but also unsure in, in many ways. Um, but for me... The goal setting and actually writing down my goal was something that I very specifically found was incredibly important, um, not just because of the fact that 
you're you're putting it down, but also because I also had the tendency, and now as I've gotten older and my brain has become considerably less elastic than it once was, um, I used to be able to keep things in my mind better. And, but even then, I started to realize that the conception I had of a certain goal in my mind turned out to be almost always not nearly as concrete. You know, and in that goal setting... You know, if you look at, say, the smart approach, mm. it, the first one is specific, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very specific and measurable. So these these concrete things you need to know about the goal and the process of writing it down to me often made me realize that, you know what, this goal is pretty vague. Uh, it, I really don't. Yeah, I have a goal, but it's not super specific. And so for me, it was really writing down. Uh, things. Um, but you also make a great point, and it's a great lead into next week's topic that understanding my own social styles as well helped me understand where my strengths were and where my weaknesses were. And, um, you know, I ended up actually developing quite a few of my weaknesses um, that have since become pretty solid strengths for me uh, based on those social styles. And we'll talk more about that next week. So we will wrap up for this week. If you have topics or questions for us on any of the things we've covered or uh, ideas for us on things to cover in future episodes, reach out to us on our Twitter account at value underscore ability, or you can find us on our webpage value-ability.com. Click on the contact us tab. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook at valueability, all one word. Uh, reach out to us on any of those platforms. Let us know if you have topics or questions. Also, please sign up for our mailing list if you would like specific uh, exclusive content, value-ability.com. Click on the Contact Us tab. And wherever you find us, like, review, subscribe, and share the mantra of podcasters everywhere. As we mentioned, next episode, understanding social styles to manage yourself and others. We will continue this self-development theme and talk about how to use social styles in uh, both managing yourself and uh, developing yourself and in working with employees and coworkers. As always, thank you for listening, Philip. It was, as always, super enjoyable. So have a great week. Thank you, Dan, and you do and the same to you as well. Awesome. And to our audience, please join us next week. Thank you for listening. And remember that financial success comes from building a plan on the foundation of your values and building your ability will help you get there. This is a podcast collaboration, not a peer-reviewed journal or a sponsored publication. We make no representations as to accuracy, completeness, correctness, suitability, or validity of any information in this podcast and will not be liable for any errors, omissions, or delays in this information or any losses, injuries, or damages arising from its display or use. All information is provided on an as-is basis. It is the listener's responsibility to verify their own facts. You should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment discussed on this podcast. Strategies or investments discussed may fluctuate in price or value. Investors may get back less than invested. Investments or strategies mentioned on this podcast may not be suitable for you. This material does not take into account your particular investment objectives, financial situation, or needs, and is not intended as recommendations appropriate for you. You must make an independent decision regarding investments or strategies mentioned on this podcast. Before acting on information on this podcast, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and strongly consider seeking advice from your own financial or investment advisor. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of any other agency, organization, employer, or company. Assumptions are not reflective of the position of any entity other than the authors, and since we are critically thinking human beings, these views are always subject to change, revision, and rethinking at any time. Please do not hold us to them in perpetuity.